Why do they say that? You have to talk to the physicists about yeah. this because they say that it's immersion and they use all these words because in a universe in physics, there is no time. When did she come in? Um, like so how I many think, years into the process? Well, I think we, I, I kind of materialized the art. Uh, you know, so I would say I went back to my childhood building survival kits. So it was always in my head. And then when I was going into the origin of life stuff and artificial life stuff, and everyone was arguing about defining life and NASA wanted to define life so you could go and measure it. I was like, ah, there's something else we need to do here. And I think I started to do that about 2014. I met Sarah before then and we did a, we, she organized a conference on reconceptualizing origins of life. Hmm. And, but I met her before a NASA meeting where she was talking about information and life and life and she's an incredibly um interesting speaker in that she's very she speaks very fast she's incredibly articulate but she abstracts in a way that you know that you're being told something interesting but you don't really understand what the fuck it, it, it is it, it, <laughs> no 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 it's much more elegant than that it's really interesting and then I, when i met her i was like i have no clue what you're talking about but it sounds good <laughs> And she was like, what? And I'm quite a, you know, I'm quite a critical character. So, so people, I think, knowing our collaboration, think it's quite funny because like, how can you guys possibly yeah. work together? Because she is really nice and very articulate and you're just super critical. <laughs> and I'm like, no, but that's not exactly how it worked, right? I knew that Sarah, from listening to Sarah, she understood there's something missing in physics. Physics, the, the physics we have right now isn't sufficient to explain um, the origin of life and how life works. And I knew that the origin of life people were trapped in a series of dogmas. And then, so we started talking and then, um, and I was, we, we got, we, we, we wrote some grants together that were funded and our team started working together. Assembly theory was coming through at that time. I kind of invented it with, um, with one of with my, <laughs> I actually invented assembly theory with my, with an administrator in my group. <laughs> An administrator. Yeah. Not even one of the scientists. No. Inve you saying invented the name or invented the actual? No, and did the work. Like, so I was like, you know, almost a sucker for finance. Smartest secretary I've ever seen. Um, so this is the guy, was, he was my financial admin guy. I hired him. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to him one day and he was telling me, I'm not sure if you want me to say, but probably it's okay. He probably won't mind. But he had a, it turns out he had a degree, has a degree in physics and math. Convenient. And I was like, why are you just doing that? come on, let's talk about science. And he was like, what? And so, so anyway, I was building the concept for assembly theory, um, and, you know, from a chemistry experiment, like chopping up molecules and like, building the algorithms. And, and I, he had a go at writing the first algorithm with me. And he actually got the algorithm wrong. It didn't, it was the, but the, I, it was pretty much there. And we were arguing backwards and forwards. And then we, we got the algorithm a bit better. And then um, he actually started a PhD I guess a year or two later, he got his PhD. Not, oh, okay. So, so he, he got, made the shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's still yeah. doing financial administration in the group, helping <laughs> me get the group. But he also does research now as wow. a postdoc. What so, a story. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. And then, and but then in that, um, then Sarah's t Sarah became involved because I realized that actually, although I invented it, I mean, what does that mean? I'm like, well, probably Sarah also invented something similar, if not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But but I guess who who cares who invented what? We both saw that there was a problem that needed to be solved, and science is about problems. Sarah saw there was a problem in physics with information, and I saw there was a problem in origin of life with dogma and defining life. And that's how we started working together, and our teams have been working together ever since uh, wow. on that. And it's kind of interesting because, again, our teams are like slightly different cultures and slightly different interactions. So. But that's good. You need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I think Sarah's team are beginning to realize that I have strong views weakly held. <laughs> so and so it's because they're like, oh, you know, Sarah says, well, I think my team will want to do this. And they're worried about what you think. I'm like, fuck who, that. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as long as the, 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 I, you could, they could explain to me what, the the, what they're doing theory wise. And there's some, you know, there's lots of things in assembly theory, which are kind of very, I have a very strong intuition for, but I wasn't able to explain. So like, for instance, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, so he, let me give you one thing, which is kind of mind blowing even now. So uh, when you have a molecule um, and you chop the molecule up, the molecule, um, there's a shortest path to make that molecule. 
So that means if you have all the parts, let's say you make the molecule and it has, you know, I don't know, all these different bits, you can chop it up. Um, but then there is a really convenient way to make the molecule on the shortest path. And for me, the shortest path was really important. And my team were like, no, it's the average path. I'm like, no, 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 it's not the average path. That's nonsense. It's the shortest path. And the reason why the shortest path is important is you can measure the shortest path. It's not possible to measure an average path very easily, right, uh, with a molecule, because you don't know all the, all the construction ways. But there is a threshold where you can have no shortest path. You can't go below a shortest path. That's, there's, so that kind of was really interesting. So I guess the, the assembly theory says, hey, complexity doesn't arise by chance when you have it in abundance. You have the assembly equation, which explains that. There's this thing called the assembly index, which is the, nu the number of steps you take on a graph, the shortest number of steps using the building blocks to make the object. Mm -hmm. So whether the object's made out of Lego or letters or molecule or atoms and bonds, you can do that. So, and that's how, how we've been working on assembly theory. But where time comes in. Yeah, that's the fourth it, time today. Dude. It, it, time Fuck. comes in is like we realize that if I've got a molecule and, and the molecule is quite complicated, and obviously we know the molecule was made by evolution. Let's say and take a molecule like Taxol, which is a natural product, a secondary metabolite made in the Pacific yew tree in the bark. Mm. Just happens to be quite a good anti-cancer drug. It's devilishly complicated. It has lots of chiral centers, which means it has handed this, right? It has left-handed and right-handed things in it. And it has this very complicated kind of structure. It would take a while for a chemist to make it. The enzymes in the Pacific yew tree can make it. It's great, right? It's a, but it's one of those molecules that can't form by chance in a random universe in any abundance. It would take too long, right? Okay. Even if you have it, you know, finite universe and infinite time. Having taxol together in one small volume, it, it would just not feasible, yeah. right? Good. And um, and so, you know, it, I then I kind of imagine that that, um, that now we can just take that molecule out and just imagine it can exist without life, you can then, the assembly index tells you how unlikely it is. So now what that means is like, if I do all these combinations together, it also gives you a fundamental limit on the amount of time that needs to have passed to make the object. And then okay. I'll say, ah, oh, okay, now I've got this, the taxol is proof that there was a history Causal, causal structures, enzymes, and evolution. And it puts a time limit on how long it took for that to be made, right? And so what I suddenly realized is that um, evolution requires time. In biology, duh, of course. But if you go to physics and say, evolution requires time because there's contingency in history, the physics are like, what? Well, there's no contingency in the universe. Why do they say that? You have to talk to the physicists about yeah. this because they say that it's immersion and they use all these words because in a universe in physics, there is no time. Right. See, that's never made sense to me. It's like, how do you explain then? I could see if you were getting to some of the stuff that you say is not falsifiable. Like if you got to some of the multiverse and interdimensional stuff, okay, maybe then there's an argument that time is just like a constantly shifting thing. But if we're dealing with what we can falsify and with what we can see in this universe, I'm talking right now. In a second, you're going to respond and talk. That is categorically after no, the what I just will did. say in the block universe. So Bertrand Russell, you might want to get Bertrand Russell up okay. and try Bertrand Russell and causation. But Bertrand Russell had a, made a fund had a he looks a, like a G a famous uh, a, a famous phrase where he said. Um, causation is like the monarchy. Um, looks good, but isn't needed. <laughs> right? Looks good. <laughs> Interesting. Right? Because M Bertrand Russell was a logician. He actually was a really good mathematician. A logician? Yeah. He Log okay. basically used logic and mathematics. Yeah. And he wrote Principia Mathematica. Right? And that was going to be the book that explains all the universe and math. Sounds and then, smart and then well. Gödel came along and went, <laughs> no. <laughs> and what Gödel showed is that you can't, that mathematics isn't a closed system. It's very complicated and very nuanced. And it's basically about... It's what about, does he mean closed system? It's about understanding how to prove something and yeah. if something is true or not. And they, you can, and it, it basically explains that the way that layers and language work. It's quite interesting. But if we go back to causation, 
physics think that time is a coordinate, that you have this thing called the block universe, and you can go forward in time, and you can go back in time. Meaning we could time travel. They, that's what they hypothetically. Would, yeah, th th that's what they say, right? So what physicists say: if the universe, if physics is deterministic, then basically our conversation right now was preordained by the Big Bang. Yes. Right. So we're not creating anything new. What physics cannot deal with is creativity, and this is why computation based on physics, using LLMs and all that stuff, to my get create to distill out creativity, there is this, this is why this argument is kind of come, come large, full circle. quite large right yeah. now, right? Because yeah. of course, if you have, if you know the history, you can machine learn on it. You can milk the history, but you still can't produce the, produce the future, produce, predict the future. Mm. So now this is why you have this interplay of different things. So assembly theory says, hey, complicated things can't just in, in any abundance don't just happen they needed a history that history is captured in what we call causation right and we make an assembly space right and in assembly theory we have four universes the first universe is like the universe of everything like all everything is possible in this universe you have infinite universe infinite time infinite space so all possible configurations can exist but we don't see that. That's a combinatorial universe, right? Even the laws of physics in the assembly universe, they can have all different laws of physics. Then you have the assembly possible. And that is like, okay, given the laws of physics that we have, what objects are allowed, right? So assembly, assembly possible says like, you know, the quantum mechanics has these energies, there's all this stuff, right? You can, carbon can have a number, certain number of bonds, blah, blah, blah. So you can have combinatorial access to the universe. This is like now no time is in, there's no time in this universe. You can just literally pull on every object in the universe and put it together. Then you have the, the so that's, that's, so you've got assembly universe, everything, assembly possible. Then you've got assembly contingent, which mm -hmm. is like, Oh no, you can't just have objects that were made way at the end of the universe at the beginning. That's cheating. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the time. So assembly contingent says not all objects are available at each point in time. You have to make them. So the first time you make an object, you have to go through the steps to make the object. And then you have the final universe, which is the universe that we live in, which is assembly observed. So that means you can make observations and go, all oh, these complicated objects, they required a certain amount of time to get made. So if you take, say, like some of your technology here, if I was to reproduce the technology, how much time would it take? What was the shortest path to go from mm. sand to a microprocessor? So what assembly theory basically says is like complex things in abundance aren't spontaneous. They require evolution to make them selection or technology. And technology is connected to evolution selection, number one. It says that also complex objects have an amount of time you have to go through, a number of things you have to do that's non-negotiable. Now you can have different buds of time where they're not interacting right just like different you just want processes to occur and then um assembly theory says there's these assembly spaces where you can imagine these objects what they're going to do next now the assembly possible or sorry the assembly possible to assembly contingent is very interesting the assembly possible actually by the way is the same as david deutsch's constructor theory it is the assembly possible basically says all transformations in that universe are allowed to act on things and you can make stuff but that assembly possible is a universe with no time mm. and constructor theory which is a way of instantiating quantum information actually in the universe and making computation fundamental says that you don't need any time mm. but again if you need time, then if t because you don't have access to the future, you don't have infinite resource, it says that the, that the universe itself is not computable. Wait a second. It, access to the future meaning you can't go there right now, but that doesn't mean that the future is not going to happen. The future is dependent critically on the past, right? Yes. You, but, and if the universe is expanding in time... The only way you can get to the future is actually by doing the operation, by going to the future, by yes. allowing it to happen. Whereas the computationists say, no, no, I can simulate it. And physicists say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's why they say it's infinite. Yeah. Uh. So you have this interesting, the, 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 the argument we're having is that, you know, time doesn't exist on one hand because you've got, if you think about it, the big, ba the, the, what are the four things that physics need? They need, um, they need, order at the beginning so somehow the big bang was magically ordered and all the things that were going to happen in the future were encoded at the big bang 
So this is God. Mm. If you're a classical physicist today, you are religious, I would argue. Right? They I may, could see that. Yeah, yes. you, you're saying that all of the future is encoded in the past. Therefore, God did it. Because God had to give you all the knowledge. Yeah. Right? If you're a super determinist, right? So you so basically, number one, you're saying God did it. Number two, you're saying time is emergent. Causation is emergent. <laughs> right? And and so and and that you have to have this order. Now you can replace those four things with one thing to say time is real. And hey presto, you explain physical reality. <laughs> there is no time travel. It's a, that's a that's a nonsense term, right? Because time is. Time you believe is, that's not possible. No, it's not possible. It's just it's not possible. You can, well, you can travel into the future. You can use time dilation. You can use relativity, yes. right? Yes. You can use the rules. You don't think we can go into the past and manipulate because you believe time is actually on a scale on like physics. It's, that's just like, it's, yeah, it's not, it's just okay. not possible. Time is not a thing that you can, it's not a coordinate. It is a, in, um, a non-negotiable process we are all involved in. Yeah, Chain, and that's where I really love. So the, you essentially believe in time the way a normal human does, yes. rather than what the physicists may try to exactly. Tell us okay. And I remember in my A-level physics arguing with my physics teacher about time. She said, "No, no, you don't understand time. <laughs> time, time is just about measuring change." And I'm like, "But no, no, no. Evolution says, and we're just taught this. And I think that the fundamentals of physics and quantum mechanics." have a problem. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.